Hey Sue, how are you doing? I'm doing okay today. It's a beautiful day, albeit very cold outside. Cold, because uh, we're getting into spring now, aren't we? So it should be, I mean, because I remember, because you're in, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you're in New York at the moment, aren't you? I, I'm actually, personally, I'm in Connecticut right now, but yes, New oh, England, yeah. yeah. Right, okay. Because Well, usually... it's spring, sort of, but every day is different when it's spring in New England, so. <laughs> yeah, it's, so how long have you, so have you just kind of migrated over there for lockdown? Because I know a lot of my friends, have been, uh, under, obviously COVID's been happening. So they've just been like going away from New York and the city and London as well. Did you do the same thing when COVID happened? Well, Old Lyme has always been my home. So um, I had a pied a terre in New York, but, but here is where I live. So um, when lockdown happened, I actually was getting off a plane from London on the 12th of March. And my plan was to go into New York City to celebrate the third year anniversary of Come From Away. And I uh, got off the plane and got the uh, confirmation that Broadway was shut down. So I got in a car and went to Connecticut and I've been here ever since. I mean, what, I, mean I don't want to go too much into COVID, but what was, what was, because I, I remember hearing that as well when like, when Broadway's shut down, like we have the, we obviously have the West End in the UK, which is nothing compared to what it is like putting on a show in Broadway. So like, what is it feel like when, Broadway's like closed. I mean, that's a massive thing. Uh, it's yes, it's pretty massive. And it's not anything that anybody could have possibly imagined. And for it to have gone on as long as it has, has been truly challenging, truly challenging. But um, have, have we're you, starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. So. Well, yeah, I know same thing here as well, because I don't know if you're aware, like we obviously got major restrictions at the moment, but we're slowly coming off our restrictions, I think, by, by June, I think it, we won't have any sort of like um, social distancing or anything like that. And it's quite nice that I've seen so many theatre shows now coming back on uh, for sale now to buy tickets and all the tours now sure. are happening by January 2022. Is that similarly for, for Broadway as well? Are you, are, you, are you guys coming back online like maybe early next year? Well, I, I, I'm hopeful we'll be back um, by this fall, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. I mean, if everything keeps moving in the right direction, and I'm paying a lot of attention to all of you because we have a production of Come From Away there that we'd like to get reopened again. So. I know, and I've seen it about, yeah. how many times? I think I've seen it about eight times. Oh, well, good I, for you. Hopefully you'll see it nine as soon as we come back. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully. So what I want to know, before we kind of go on to what you're kind of doing at the moment, I'd love to know how it all started from the top. Like, where did you, where did you get the theatre bug? Is your family in it? Like, where did it start? No, no, God knows. My dad was a plumber and my mother was a telephone operator. We didn't have theatre in our lives at all. Mm -hmm. I think I first fell in love with theater when I watched, you know, like movie musicals on television. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then when I was a kid, I started, I'd like did a, like a performance. I think it was like in the Girl Scouts and um, I loved performing. Um, and I did that all through school. And uh, even when I went to college, I was going to be a history major, but the first weekend there, I walked down to the theater department and auditioned for something. And even though I didn't get the job, I got put into a stage crew and um, I never looked back. You know, I got a major in theater from Smith College. I moved to New York as soon as I got out of school and worked in theater management offices for a while. Mm -hmm. Finally gave up the idea of being an actor. It was too hard for me. I couldn't. I couldn't deal with the stress. Yeah, of it. it's honestly. I don't know. How, I. This is a little side thing. I was going to be an actor back in the day. I was going to train acting, and then someone said to me, "Don't be a starving artist." And I was like, oh, "I'm really." Bad. I was like, "Maybe I'm not cut out for it." Because I. I like to have a bit of a lifestyle, but I think unless you've really made it as an actor, it's so difficult to really kind of have like. Oh, it. it it's yeah. very hard and you have to be so focused and so disciplined. And I realized that I was much more interested in all the other things around it mm -hmm. uh, rather than uh, the, the performing element of it. So I worked as a manager for a while. I was in New York for about eight years. I company managed on Broadway mm -hmm. and then decided to take a break because I didn't think that was the direction I wanted to stay in. Mm -hmm. I have this habit of like every 10, 15 years making an abrupt change. Um, so I quit company management. I went out to this little um, theater in Connecticut called the Goodspeed. I thought it was gonna be for the summer. 
summer and I ended up being there for 20 years. Wow. which is how I ended up with a house here in Connecticut and all of that. Connecticut. And I was at the Goodspeed for 20 years. And then I just quit that and started um, Junkyard Dog Productions. Uh, so what, and what, while I was at Goodspeed is when I... What, go ahead. What made you just quit? Just to go, you know, after 20 years, I'm just going to quit and I'm going to do my own thing. Well, they were going to throw me a party. And I said, you know what? When they throw you a party, it's time to go. Oh, really? So, Yeah. That's the way I feel. It's like, no, if I've been here long enough to deserve a party, I've been, I need to move on. So they, and, were, um, well, they were throwing you a party for 20 years. Is that what it was? Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And it was like, nah, time to go. <laughs> been here too long. So, but I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, so I just quit. And then started to think about what I might like to do. And I done what I what I had done at Goodspeed was I produced all their new work for the for those 20 years I was there. I produced over 50 new musicals. Yeah. I realized that's what I loved. I loved producing musicals. I loved putting uh, new work on the stage. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I wanted to take what I had learned and and ultimately decided I would be my own boss and see how that would work out. And yeah. um, I had been talking with a colleague of mine about this and he said, well, maybe I'll quit my job and I'll come join you. So we both literally like jumped off a cliff and started Junkyard. I, I've, been, I've been having lots of conversations with many people uh, over the, for the last year. Uh, one of the COVID, but two, everyone's kind of reflecting on where their path is taking them at the moment. And so a lot of people are starting their own businesses now, like loads of people I know. What was the kind of deciding factor, apart from the party? When did you know that it wasn't like 10 years in or 15 years in that you had, had to go and do your own thing? Like what was the, the voice? And did you go, oh, financially, how am I going to make this work? And all sorts of things, the anxieties of starting something new. Well, yeah, probably, it's probably about 15 years in when I realized I needed to start thinking about something else. Mm -hmm. um, you know, working working in a regional theater has has its has its pros and its cons. And and I realized what I was doing is I was developing a lot of work, but I wasn't able to actually see it go on, mm -hmm. and and move beyond the initial productions that we had created. Mm -hmm. And I saw an enormous amount of talent that just wasn't getting its due. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, the thing about musical theater is Broadway's mecca. Right, you've got to, you've got to, you've, and it's also one of the few places where you can make a living. So, mm -hmm. it, it's frustrating uh, to to watch all of these amazingly talented people not not get the opportunity to move on. So, when Randy and I talked about starting a new business, we thought, well, what are those shows that we love that never got their due? Mm -hmm. What could we do? What could we do to bring them to fruition and bring them to life? So, that was it. You know, I think sometimes. I was always I was always a person who needed a paycheck, right? Mm -hmm. I had you know I didn't I I was not and that was another thing challenging about being a performer, right? Because you're yeah. always going from gig to gig. Yeah, yeah. and it didn't it, that didn't work for me. I didn't come from money. Um, my parents um, did not have a lot of money. They were not in a position to support some crazy career, uh, and I, I always wanted to take care of myself. I felt that was really important. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I followed jobs that were fairly steady and provided paychecks. So it's kind of ironic that at the golden age of 50, I just decided I would just like not worry about that anymore. That's what I so, mean. That's why I'm so like, yeah. so intrigued to go, how did you know? Because obviously it gets harder as you get older to just take more, to take risks. When you're younger, no one sure. really needs you. You can start companies, you can fail a company, no one really cares. But when you get older, obviously you have all this experience and you have all these contacts, but it gets a lot harder because you're like, okay, I still got to, I now I've got to hustle again at 50. You know, I didn't say it was a smart idea. It was just, <laughs> you know, it was just, it, it, it was actually kind of ridiculous, but I was very fortunate. I'm married. My husband has a job that was enough to keep us in health insurance and pay the mortgage, you know, um, it was, it was not. It was not a smart thing to do. It was just a necessary thing to do. But it, I needed a change, and it paid off. It paid off in the end because I think I always, it only took fifteen years. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
because so, I have the, I have this quote at the at the bottom of my email signature, and it is it always says like, only look at Plan A, because if you plan and you look at Plan B, you can't do Plan A. And I think when you get to the, obviously for you, when you quit your job for twenty years and you do your own thing. You can only do that. I mean, you could potentially go back, go backwards, but you always want to go forward. You want to go, well, I've, I've come yeah. this far now. I've got this company. It's got to, it's got to work. It's got to happen now. So, what was the first kind of couple of years then? Like, I'm, I'm sure there might be some panic. There might have been like, oh, is this a really good idea? And like, and then finding the right projects to work on as well. Um, yeah, the first. The first year of it was really anxiety producing. Um, we were starting to look at different projects again, writers that we liked, projects that we had been interested in when we were running our theaters. We were very fortunate, a mutual friend introduced us to someone who originally said he wanted to come in and, and invest in the company, but um, we spent some time together and he said he, he actually wanted to be our partner. And he uh, it put some money into the company to keep us floating. Mm -hmm. um, so there's actually four, four junkyard dogs and uh, Randy and I are the ones who are in New York sort of doing the day-to-day -day managing operations, but our partners, Kenny and Marlene Alhadaf, live in Seattle and have been enormously supportive and are you know, fully integrated into everything that we do. So that's how we formed, but that wasn't the plan. I mean, we were originally gonna raise small investment amounts, you know, but um, that just didn't, that's not where we went. And I have always been a person who believed that you point yourself in a direction and then wherever you go, that's where you're gonna end up, right? And it's not about, um, well, this is the plan, so I've got to stick to it. It's like, okay, let's see where this takes us. Let's see where this takes us. Let's see where this takes us. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's sort of, I can totally understand because I always say about the universe, like let you go into one path and let the universe, let, let the outside things do its magic. And then you just respond to with the opportunities that are surrounded by you. So I have to ask, why Junkyard Dog? Like, where, oh, I, where well, did that come from? I love names that are so interesting and unique. So when Randy, Randy Adams and I were talking about starting the company, we were both still working with our respective theaters and we met at a musical theater conference in Los Angeles. And there was a, and, and we said, look, at least this weekend, we've got to come out of this with a name for the company, right? And it's not going to be Randy Sue production. So let's, let's, let's come up with a name while we're together because he was on the West Coast, I was on the East Coast. It was a great opportunity to spend some time together. So um, we were listening to a panel on turning movies into musicals. Mm -hmm. And there were people on the panel from MGM and somebody from ASCAP and, and um, uh, Dean Pitchford from Footloose, yeah. right? So, and of course he did the movie and the musical of Footloose and he was talking about it and he said, you know, the only way a musical, musical happens is if it has a junkyard dog yapping at its heels. And Randy and I looked at each other from across the room and went, that's our name. That's our name, Junkyard Dog, because that's who we are. We're the Junkyard Dog yapping at the heels of the musical to make it happen. I've never heard of that expression ever. I mean, it's a very unique <laughs> Well, when we when we then decided to name the company Junkyard Dog Productions, I had to do a search to make sure there was no other theatrical company yeah, yeah, named yeah. Junkyard Dog. Now there are a lot of like um, literal junkyards and hauling, you know, like sites where people recycle things. You know, yeah, yeah, there's yeah. a and a bunch of different things called junkyard. In fact, I think there's like a band named Junkyard or something, but yeah. no no theatrical. Uh, entities so we mm. decided it was safe I, you oh. know it's funny my mom at the time she goes it doesn't sound very nice sue it doesn't sound very nice i said well sometimes you just gotta you know being a junkyard dog you just gotta you just gotta plow through you gotta do it you yeah. and not look to the left it, or the right it's, it's fascinating isn't it like for me personally like when we when you think about certain names especially within the marketing sector and the marketing kind of aspects of it you want a name, some people want names that sound really great, so it sounds enticing or some sound, it sounds unique. Like there's a bottle, I don't know if you know, a bottle brand called Fat Bastard. 
and I absolutely love it. Yes, I, I know Fat Bastard. Yep. Yeah, and I always look, and I always remember this sort of like name because I'm like, what a name for a wine, but it's recognizable by people ever, and you don't go, oh, Fat Bastard, why would I want, you go, that's really cool, and then you, it sticks to your name, so like, Junkyard Dog will stick, and it's so funny, like how people now associate that with theatre rather than actual, an actual junkyard, an actual dog, and I, I just love it. I love it. My work here is done. <laughs> That's go, great. Done. Well, and we we were very we were very uh, sort of um, certainly at the beginning and and to this day it's always we refer to the company and not ourselves. We try to make sure everybody understands it's junkyard and there's four legs to the dog, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and and we we branded the name. We didn't want to brand ourselves. We wanted to brand the name of the company. Mm -hmm. so. So, so obviously I have to talk about uh, the most fam fam obviously famous musical, Come From Away, which obviously mm -hmm. is incredible and has won an amazing amount of awards. And I just want to know, when did it all start with the show then? That's what I want to know, because I'm a massive, massive- With Come From Away? Person. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so um, my friend, Tony's friend, Jack, asked if I would meet with his daughter's husband's cousin who had written a musical okay that's how it works um so many. something like that yeah and it was actually about a, a different musical but David Hine and Irene Sankoff were uh this was their first musical they'd written together it had won some awards it, my my um it, it, my mother's Jewish lesbian Wiccan wedding. So, it, and it was a festival, it was a fringe festival winner. And I'm, I'm gonna apologize in advance. I think I got the title wrong, cause I always did. And one of yeah. the first things they said, they wanted to meet with us cause they needed advice. And the first thing I said was change the title of the show uh, cause it's impossible. It's not as good and they as- said, no, we don't want to You need a better title. No, no, it doesn't <laughs> stick. And it's usually like Jewish, Jewish lesbian Wiccan wedding. I have to like think about how the letters Anyway, yeah. so I just said, change the title. And they said, no, we don't want to do that. And I said, well, I guess the conversation's over. But I mean, we laughed, we joked, we, we, we had a nice conversation. Uh -huh. uh, Randy and I, we really enjoyed David and Irene. And so like two years later, maybe a year and a half later, we were in Toronto because they were based in Toronto. Mm -hmm. We were there with the, the tour of our show, Memphis. And um, so we called them up and said, let's have breakfast. What are you doing? How are you doing? And they were like, we're just starting a workshop of a new musical that's about um, when these planes were diverted during 9-11. I said, a 9-11 musical? Okay, good luck with that. <laughs> well, yeah, because <laughs> and so the, obviously if you explain to someone what it's about, it's about 9-11 and like the, yeah. the, the, the people who were involved in it, you just instantly go, what? When you see the show, it's nothing like what you think. It's nothing at all like that. But you know, it was the thing when they said, yes, so we're doing this music. I'm like, I oh, can't wait to hear what you name that. Oh, it was come from away. Who's going to, who does, who's going to know what that is? So, so they were just starting the workshop at Sheridan College and, um, and that was great. Just chatted, touch base, all of the above. And then I think it was like within a year, they were at a festival, the NAMP Festival, National Alliance for Musical Theater Festival in New York, and they presented 45 minutes of the show. And we were, uh, all, all four of us were there. We were all just like, oh, this is the show David and I remember talking about. Oh, fun, this will be fun to hear what they've been up to. Oh, and nice. at the end of the 45 minutes, we, we were just like, oh, mind blown, fantastic. What is this? So we, um, we were, one of many different producers and theaters who were very interested in producing the show. I have, I have and, to uh, ask, so, because people who haven't seen the show, and if you haven't seen it, you're mental. But anyway, I've seen it so many times. The show, it constantly keeps moving, like at a pace with music and stuff. How, how different is it to, to what we know compared to the, the kind of workshop version? Like, was the kind of language- It's not that different. We strung together, it's pretty much the same thing. It, it, it was it was always that sort of um, jumping in between like direct address and people talking to each other, right? So, yeah. and it was always very fast paced and and going from scene to scene to scene to scene right, very okay. quickly. Um, but when we saw it, we saw it at music stands, and it really sort of works beautifully at music stands because of all the direct address. Yeah. Um, so once we took it on as producers, the first thing we wanted to do, and we brought Chris, Chris Ashley, 
as director and, and Kelly Devine as choreographer. And the first thing we talked about is how does this show actually move on stage? What, how do you, how do you do justice to this sort of cinematic attack on the way you're telling this story? And what does it look like? So it was the first thing we did was get into a room with some tables and chairs and, and actors and try to figure out what the, what the physicality of the show was. And was it- Because uh, you, you know- Was well, it was it always stripped down version? Was it gonna, did it ever- Always, always, okay. always. No, the minute you start to add stuff, you kill it, right? You have to, it has to move like the wind. You can't even afford to have people change their clothes, yeah. right? To go from character to character. So, so every, there's 12 actors in the show. They're probably playing 80 or 90 characters total. So you have to go from putting a hat on to taking a hat off. You have to go from putting a jacket on, taking a jacket off. Yeah. And while you're doing that, you're talking, right? So it, it always had to move like the wind. Yeah. I, I think it would be like a swings nightmare. <laughs> oh, it is you should see it, it is it is it is not an easy show yeah. to to stand by for and you know when we actually the biggest change I think came when we when it was originally written it was written in two acts and one of the first things we said was we've got to get rid of this intermission there's no yeah. there's no stopping it, point it, in this it, show it, it, if it had that sort of like cut you would just feel I don't know, like an un, like a bad taste in your in your mouth. But like, oh, yeah, it, yeah. It is good. It's like, yeah, and also just for audience, just for for um, information sake, a swing is basically uh, an actor or an actress who's side stage, who's their role is to learn multiple roles and and tracks in a musical sense, and then if someone goes off, they jump in and they jump in the, the they role. jump in, and sometimes well, they, and and sometimes it can happen that there's two roles off. So the person has to jump from one track to another track in the, in the same uh, musical number, for instance, it could happen. Yeah, it, it's the hardest job in theater being a swing. And because all, all of our 12 onstage performers or principals are, are offstage performers or standbys, they stand by for all of the different roles and they each stand by, depending on the company, they each stand by for at least four, sometimes five roles. Mm -hmm. So, it, and you just watch their heads explode as they're sort of like learning all these tracks because you're not just learning the words and the music, you're moving chairs, you have chairography. Yeah. I mean, you've got yeah, different we, dialects. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Chairography. Yeah. No, so it's for a swing. If everyone, if people yeah. who Google it, go, uh, watch the trailer because the chairs move and the, into so many different positions because it's basically like doing like flies and that sort of thing. It's, it's just, it's incredible to, to learn all that sort of thing. And, and there's so many tape on the floor. When you look at the tape, you're like, how do people remember where to put them and stuff? But it's so, it's gonna be so precise and so clean because if not, it'll be out of place and you'll obviously look very bad. But- um, No, so, and you, yeah. No, go, go, you go, go. <laughs> no, I was just gonna say the entire show is a trust exercise for the performers, right? Because yeah. if that chair isn't exactly where it's supposed to be, and you sit down, you're done, you know? I mean, it's the, you, ha you have to take care of each other every step of the way in the show. Yeah, and so, and so what I want to know as well about when you, when you have a new musical or even a new project, and a, a lot of people who are, who are writers who are scripts for pitching for Netflix and all that sort of thing, you have to convince people that this show is worthy enough to go onto stage, right? So what was that process <laughs> like as, a, as the kind of leading people going, I really believe in this and I've got to convince you and I've got to make an audience as well believe and then create a fan base then to go into Broadway. Sure. Well, that was exactly what we knew we had to do because we had a, a iffy title, Come From Away. Nobody understood what that was. It was an ensemble show, so we didn't have any stars mm -hmm. and everybody was going to call it the 9-11 musical. So we, we knew that we had three strikes against us. And we also, when we took the show on, we were very frank with the authors. We said, we're, on, we're not entirely convinced this is a Broadway show, but we want to work with you to figure out where it belongs. We believe it will have an enormous life no matter what, but Broadway's tough and you've got to be able to fill 10 to 12,000 seats a week 
Um, and you've got to be able to build an audience before you even show up without any of the things that other shows have, like name title recognition or stars or any of those things. Mm -hmm. So we determined early on, and it was a conversation with the writers, with the rest of the creative team, that we were going to have to take our time with it and figure out what it was mm -hmm. and where it belonged. Mm -hmm. So we built, uh, the first thing we did after our three-week workshop to just sort of figure out the movement is we built a partnership with the La Jolla Playhouse, which is where Chris Ashley, the director, is the artistic director, and the Seattle Repertory Theater. Um, and we set up two different productions within six months of each other. To, we went to the La Jolla Playhouse first, then we we're gonna take a little bit of a break to give ourselves time for whatever work we needed to do and then go to the Seattle Rep. And then we said, by the time we get through the Seattle Rep, we'll have a good sense of what we think the trajectory of the show is. And then, so, but, but so, when, but once you have that, though, do you then, do, do, how how do you convince an audience? How do you build a fan base to go? This well, is here's the deal. Here, here's the deal. The invited dress at the La Jolla Playhouse. The next day, the phones exploded at the box office. No way. And we're like, hmm. First preview the phones tripled exploded at the box office. And then what happened was we started to see people coming back. So we, we knew right away that this was a show that people were responding to. And not only that, it was, it was all gonna be word of mouth. So how do you build word of mouth? You have to get, you have to make sure that people see it and they have the opportunity to talk about it. Mm -hmm. So we knew right from the beginning in La Jolla, right after we saw the way that audience exploded, we looked at each other and we said, hmm, maybe this show could work on Broadway if we're really, really careful about it. Mm -hmm. And so what we did is we, we built a path for the show that after La Jolla, we went to Seattle. We took another hiatus between Seattle. We went to Washington, DC. We went to Toronto. And each step of the way, we were selling out People were talking about it. People were going on social media about it. Mm -hmm. And so, and the word, the buzz was, was, was out there fairly quickly um, in, the, in the industry, you know, mm -hmm. because you can't just plop down on Broadway. You've got to build that buzz at the same yeah. time that you're also building an audience base. By the time we opened in New York, a year and a half after we did our, um, engagement in La Jolla, over a quarter of a million people had seen the show and they were talking about it. So we had managed to build um, uh, an audience. Yeah. But it was, but it was literally, and, and we knew every step of the way, don't spend a lot of time, a lot of money advertising in advance because it's not going to do any good. Your people are not going to buy tickets to the show until they either, somebody tells them to, mm -hmm. and, th and then it will go. So it was, um, that was our strategy every step of the way. Mm -hmm. And then we, as we built it, people were talking about it. So of course that means you're starting to get press and you're starting to get attention and all of that. But, mm -hmm. you know, and we only knew that because we, we'd learned that the hard way, do you know? I mean, mm -hmm. we, we had a show that we love called First Date that did really well in an out of town engagement in Seattle. And we decided to bring it in, but we didn't, take enough time with it to build the buzz that was needed um, to, to develop an audience, you know? And, and so you, and, and you it, learn those lessons. But it, it feels like, I don't know, because I'm not, and I, I've not had much experience in the Broadway sector, but especially for West End, there's loads of conversations and had been beforehand that people just bring shows to West End and they do like four weeks, five weeks or two weeks and suddenly they flop or they don't do well because they haven't had the process, the workshop, but it seems because Broadway, it, it costs even more money to go on, to put a show on, you have to give it its, you have to give it its process, its trust yeah. within the within have producers to. to make sure it is right for Broadway. And it is at a point where it's at its kind of final kind of legs, because it goes through, I'm assuming it goes through loads of different stages. And it, maybe if you go, if it goes too early, it's not really fully formed yet and you can't, you can't just be like, oh, we're going to take it off because it costs so much to put it on. Where like West End, you can put it on, but like it won't cost you as much as it would do if you were on Broadway. 
Well, and even with the West End production, we didn't want to open cold in West End. We we went to Dublin first. We were at the Abbey oh, Theatre first before we came. Uh -huh. Yeah, and we we that was a, a a great opportunity to get people to come over to see the show. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, influencers, group salespeople, ticket mm -hmm. ticket agents, all of that to sort of give them an opportunity to know what the show is because how do you describe it to people they have to see it they have to experience you it experience. you know and i think what you said about people, normal people coming back like myself because it's one of those type of shows like i give an example it's similar similar but not similar um sleep no more from punch drunk like because there's so many different stories going on and it's so quick pace it gives you it allows you to go back and re-see things and similarly with come from away because there's so much going on all the time and there's so many different layers you have to go back because you see something totally new. And that's why Punch Drunk did really, really well and does really, really well because people go back constantly to see new things. It's the same thing will come from away. You, you, every yeah. time you go back, you see something totally different. Yep, it's true. And, and the other thing that we noticed early on, which is, has always been true with our show is people come back and they bring other people with them because mm -hmm. they want to experience it with them. Yeah. You know, we saw it, people come back and when you start to recognize the people in line at the box office when you're out of town, it's like, well, I needed to come back because my grandkids are coming home on their break from school and I needed to bring them to see the show. So it's like, they're not just telling people to buy tickets, they're going out and buying more tickets to share with them. For so sure. it's that kind of show. And it's one, yeah. of, the, it's one of those yeah. type of things that once you've kind of got a hit, also I, I, another thing that I want to kind of lead, lead into is that once you have a hit and you are successful and like, like in life, you the, the struggle the struggle the struggle to get to you, the point that you want to get out. like you you're an actor and then you get your first netflix series or whatever and then you've got to the point and you're successful what did, what happens then what happened then for you guys once you had that sort of hit and it was getting nominated then how do you one manage it and then how do you then jump onto the next project because you've already had you've had one hit people know you from the comfortable way what do you do next how do you what's your next move People ask us that all the time. You know, at this point, our next move is getting all five companies have come from away back up and running yeah. and, and being healthy, you know? And we haven't been in a rush for anything new because mm. A, we knew, we're, it's, it, Junkyard is very boutique company. We do one thing at a time. We don't, you know, I, we never wanted the office to get so big that we couldn't be hands-on. Mm. So, and, and developing a new musical is an enormous amount of work and time and energy. And if, if you don't have that time, it's a terrible financial model, FYI, but it's the only way I know how to do it. So, um, so if you can't give that new show at least 35% of your time, as even in early development, moving to 50%, moving to 75, moving to 100, then you shouldn't do it. And in my opinion, because it doesn't mean that the people who are creating that show are going to sit back and wait for me to, you know, make sure come from a waste function, you know, it, it, so we, we made a very conscious decision and this was before uh, COVID. We made a very conscious decision to, to, to spend the next couple of years really um, investing our time and energy into the health of that title of this title. Because it's, um, I, I, you know, I look to producers that I admire. I look to like, you know, when the Dodgers opened Jersey Boys, yeah. they didn't do anything else for years oh, because really? they had a responsibility to Jersey Boys. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I see something like that and I think, well, that's exactly the way I feel. I have a responsibility to come from away mm -hmm. to make sure it's as strong and, and, and taken care of, uh, and you kind of know, you kind of know when it's okay to let go a little bit, but we weren't at the place yet where it was okay to let go a little bit. And now, of course, with COVID and the shutdown, we're going to have a lot of work to do to bring everything back up to steam and, yeah. and, well, and, so and make you, sure the show is in good shape. What have you been doing, aside from kind of getting the show up on its feet, what have you been doing with your time? How have you been managing um, <clears throat> You know, uh, it's a combination of things. There's, there's, um, I, I'm on a lot of different committees with the Broadway League, so I've been doing a lot of 
work with them, task force work. You know, when we first shut down, nobody thought it was going to take that long. We thought it was going to be a few weeks, then it was going to be a few months, you know? So there's all of this sort of like ongoing, what do we do to build ourselves back up? So I spent a lot of time in those meetings. Um, I, I, uh, I'm a teacher. I had teach a class at Columbia at the School of the Arts with the, uh, the master's program in role of producing. I, um, I, cook a lot. I uh, take care of, I, my husband and I both have, you know, older, older moms that we like to keep our eyes on. And uh, um, my daughter's been home with us because she's been uh, working remotely. So that's been a real bonus, I, honestly, to have your adult child come back and live with you harmoniously. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the same thing yeah. with my family. My, we, me and my sister went back for lockdown into Devon, which is just outside yeah. of London about three hours yeah. so and my parents absolutely loved it for the for the first couple of months because they were just like i'm back like i'm in my 20s like i left when i was like 15 or something like that and i left to be in london i've been in london now like 12 13 years now to go back so it must be such a great thing to have your your um, your daughter back as well in, a, in, in it your is it's, well. it's great so do, it's do, great and and so I was, going, Go I was going to say, does your, does your daughter kind of follow in your footsteps and, and a big kind of theatre lover? She's studying, she's in medical school. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so different then, probably not then. No, I, well, I, I think she looked at me and what I do and said, not doing that. <laughs> a lot of work, it's a lot of work. If you, it's, it's funny, like if you calculate, I have a lot of friend, a lot of friends in theatre, and so if you calculate all the hours that you put into into what you do, and you compared it to a corporate job like lawyering or whatever, you'd be at, you'd be like absolutely minted the amount of hours that you put in compared to other people who do these kind of corporate jobs. And I think people look at that going, "Why do you do it?" And then you go, "Well, I love it." <laughs> yeah, it's true. I mean, you know, I mean, it. it I've never done anything else, right? So I don't, I don't have anything to base it off of other than, you know, working in a grocery store when I was in high school, I, I've never done anything else. So, mm -hmm. um, but I, I don't think that it's, <laughs> I, I, you know, any sensible human being would run in the other direction when you see the kind of lifestyle and you see the kind of craziness. Yeah. That, but, that, but, what, but once the show is up and it's the first night and that curtain goes up, it all is all worth it. And then now you have a, you have five shows that go on and then you're like, okay, well, it's worth it then. <laughs> yes. And as I say, it only took 15 years. <laughs> yeah. I suppose if you income average, you know. <laughs> is, so is that, is that probably the biggest piece of advice you could probably say is that take your time. I imagine that because you've had such an amazing career and journey. And I think from only just knowing you just from this, from this call that you are okay just to be take things slow and not to rush i think we're in a society now where like everything is rush 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 and like these young producers that i know as well who some of them have really got their head on their shoulders and they and they go no it needs to be it needs to be right so if we need to, if it needs to take three years to do it takes three years to do rather than going let's bang it all out in a year and then suddenly you haven't got the product what you what you think you should have the product i think so, that's right i think I think you just, you, you can't rush it. You can't rush the process. You can't, and every show is different, right? Every show needs its own path. Mm. And, um, and you have to figure out what that path is and everybody has to agree to it, you know? Mm. Um, and I, and it, sometimes it's hard because I, I think particularly the people who are creating the show, they just want to see it up, right? They just want to get the work done and see it up. And sometimes you, you, you have to sort of negotiate that path and figure out what makes the most sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, But you know, that's trial and error over many, many years, right? It didn't just like occur to me all of a sudden. That, you know, it's like, oh, it, in that, that adage that you learn more from your mistakes than your, your failures than your successes is absolutely yeah. true. Because once you, once you, once you make a big flop, you don't ever want to do that again. Exactly. <laughs> well, it costs too much money. Cost so much money. What was you? Well, I'm, I'm curious. What was you like in your early twenties then, when you were just coming in the industry? Like, what was you like as a person? Was you very uh, active? Was you very ambitious? Like, what were you like? Oh, I'm. I'm sure I was ambitious and active. I went. Um, 
I really enjoyed my work as a company manager. I was on the I was on the road for a while. Um, I worked all the time. I didn't I didn't do anything else. You know, I was very single single minded yeah. uh, in terms of of what it was I was doing. And I, you know, even I, even now I look back and I think there were certain things I wish I'd made a little bit more time and space for. You know, personal things that you just sort of like said, oh, I I can't go to that wedding. I'm too busy. Or you know, those kinds yeah. of things. It was like like why did I miss that? You know, why couldn't I have made myself? Wow take two days off to go do something that ultimately was going to be important. Do you know what I mean? It's, it, those are the things you try to, you, you try not to, to do that when you don't. Did did your mind slightly alter as you got, what, what age did you feel like maybe those mistakes that you made in your personal life in terms of work overtaking personal things? Did, was it was it slightly later that when you became more successful that you're like okay now I can time I can take a bit bit more of a break and I can go to that wedding and stuff because I remember I remember I was exactly the same when I was in my twenties in my in my nineteen twenty I just didn't go to anything and someone really someone once said to me it was really a great photographer he said over the last ten years the only thing I've ever, ever remembered or out of all my whole ten years of working is the weddings, the dinners that I go to. I don't remember any of the jobs. And I find that really fascinating and profound. I think, and I think there's a lot of truth in that, you know, and I think that just sort of comes over time, Mm. you know, and I have the benefit of being old, right? So I look back at some of this and I think, well, that was just dumb, Sue, that was just dumb. But then there were moments where I made decisions based on something that I thought was more important personally than professionally and uh, pass up opportunities that I don't regret at all. You mm. know, I think you, you make these choices as you, as you get older. I mean, certainly having a child, you make choices that you wouldn't ever make if you didn't have children, you know? Yeah. And, and those kinds of things, those are like life decisions that make you who you are. And, and, and I don't ever, I don't think I ever made any, there, I had a, there was one decision I made that I always wonder what would have happened if I'd said yes. And that was, I was offered a job to go work and live in London. In, but in it was, that? it came in London, in London. Oh, London. And it came, and I'd always wanted to, I always wanted to, to work in London. And, um, but it came at a time in my personal life where I thought, you know what, if I leave, um, some, it's gonna change everything irrevocably personally for me. Mm-hmm. And, and I said, no. And, uh, and so I've always wondered what would have happened if I'd made that decision, but I don't regret it for a minute. No, no, because you know no, I mean? you're here because you're, yeah. you're here now. So as we round yeah. up the episode, what I always ask uh, my guests is a give back. So something that you, we've talked about lots of different things in, on, on the podcast, and we talk about things that you would kind of do differently or the things that you reflected on. What things would you give in terms of a, if a mantra or a film or a theater show that's really inspired you that you would give back to someone else to inspire them? Um, I don't know that I have any like uh, film or book or anything like that. I, I think what I've been trying to do is to listen more and to sort of um, be a little bit more curious about what other people are doing mm-hmm. um, and, and, and try to, try not to be so, so single focused that I'm not aware of what's happening around me. Do you know if that makes any sense whatsoever? Like for example, every day I read the, this, this little cheat sheet that comes in called the Broadway briefing, right? And there's always little, snippets of things. And I usually just sort of like breeze through them. And then there was there was one this morning that was highlighted a, a talk uh, that a, a, a group had created and it was called um, Broadway Women's Alliance. It was created by some some women in the, in the business, yeah, all very much younger than me, but I've been working with a couple of them on uh, one of the Broadway League Task Forces. And I thought, oh, that's so interesting. I I didn't even know this was really happening. So I clicked on it and I listened to the whole thing. And I was like, wow, you know, isn't it great to know that no matter how old you get, you can still learn something, you know? And I learned something from listening to it. Whereas if I'd been in a different mood, if I'd been even more single focused than I I am normally, I would have said, I don't have time for that now. I don't have time for that now. So that's, I guess, that's my advice is you do have time. 
you choose what you do have time for. Yeah, you do. Because you are, the only thing you can control is your reactions and what you make time to do. Yeah. I think it's about yeah. going prioritizing, but also knowing when you could have, take the, the foot off the pedal, as they say, and then go, actually, I'm going to divert right. my focus slightly here. Because I think this would be really educational. And, I, and I'm echoing as well, like, you take an initiative as well and, and saying like, even though at my age, like I'm still learning, but I think you should be every, every, like to, to you, till you go, you should be learning absolutely every single day. And I think that's what happens sometimes when you get to a certain uh, age or a certain uh, path in your career where you become very successful. Sometimes we do uh, not open ourselves to, uh, enough to what is going on. We Think, and, we, and we're doing our path and we're actually sometimes it's really great just to open our eyes a tiny bit more and then you get and you see different things you're like oh okay yeah, I didn't know about that how oh, this is going on now because you're so sometimes set in your own like focus way because you, you've done it you've done this. exactly right exactly right and 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 it's if if you don't actively open your mind or your ears to that then yeah. it's you wouldn't necessarily um, know what you're missing, right? So, well, I want to say thank you so much for coming three sticks to yourself. You don't welcome. honestly, you don't, you don't understand how much I am a fan of your show and like what you've done. So, I'm, for me, it's I'm very, very happy to hear it. <laughs> cool.